Thank you. I want to set my social location first. I am the son of a couple from the Northeast Georgia mountains who decided in 19, about 1960 that God had called them to be Southern Baptist missionaries on a predominantly Muslim island, the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. And so off they went and I spent uh, my entire childhood there until I graduated from high school. Uh, so the Muslim call to prayer downstairs is far more comforting to me than uh, the rantings of a hellfire and damnation Southern Baptist uh, preacher. And that makes me suspect to everybody. Uh, I want to tell you a story. Uh, 20 years ago, I went to a conference on religious diversity in Atlanta. There were about 300 people there. As part of the conference, we divided up into, a, uh, in, into pairs and had a tolerance workshop. The leader of the workshop asked us to uh, identify the religious group against which we had the most prejudice. Uh, so I thought hard. Uh, a Hare Krishna woman had tried to give me a flower in the airport one time, and she said she was giving it to the most handsome men in the airport, and I was 17 at the time. I believed her. Uh, then she asked for a donation. So I'd always kind of uh, had a little prejudice. And so I said, Hare Krishna. The woman I was partnered with said, uh, Roman Catholic. And then we started with our words to do word association. Hare Krishna airports and so forth. She said, uh, uh, when I said Roman Catholic to her, all of her answers had to do with uh, the fact that Catholics drank heavily and worshipped Mary. That was sort of where she went with her prejudice. Uh, then we went back into the large group and uh, they asked all the persons who said Roman Catholics to stand and to scream out their words and they wrote them on the board. Uh, and uh, then they had those folks sit and the Catholics to stand and respond to the words. It was very effective. Then they got to Baptists. What group of people do you think uh, more folks had prejudice against in that room than any other group? Baptists. How many Baptists do you think go to conferences on religious diversity in Atlanta 20 years ago? Two. We had found each other, partnered off, of course, shared our words, uh, and I had to sit and listen as words like bigots, racists, misogynists, and so forth were shared about my people, and then I had to stand and de defend them. I didn't have time to voice it at the conference, but the truth of the matter is that as much good as bad can result from taking one's religion seriously. It all depends upon what one chooses to be radical about. We Baptists are radical. When we embrace a theological idea, we embrace it fully and we defend it passionately. And unfortunately, when we embrace a prejudice, we do it uh, quite as radically as well. And my hope is that there is something to be learned from a tradition which does take its faith seriously particularly in a world in which religious radicalism is often viewed as the source of the violence in the world rather than as the solution to it. And so I'd like to suggest in this paper that the path to peace in the world is through a more radical embrace of our religious traditions rather than through the path of moderation as we practice them. A story about one Baptist a Puritan and sometimes Baptist who was among the most radical and extreme sectarian and ideological Puritans and Baptists who ever lived. His name was Roger Williams. And what is so interesting to me about Williams is that his religious extremism led him to a surprisingly progressive position on religious liberty. In, indeed, many consider him to be the father of religious freedom. But Williams didn't come to his position from the standpoint of enlightened thinking and the dignity of the individual person, as did folks like James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. Rather, he came at it from deep 
theological and sectarian roots that emerged out of his Puritan and Calvinist embrace of the idea of the goodness and sovereignty of God, and concomitantly, the notion of the total and utter depravity of humanity. So I think Williams offers a way forward for us when it comes to fostering dialogue. It is possible to be so convinced of the rightness of your own faith that it leads you toward offering greater freedom to others rather than less. And I'd like to take Williams' position and do what Williams always did, and that's to push it even further uh, than he did. I won't take time to review Williams' biography, but suffice it to say he was born around 1603 in London, educated at Cambridge. He fell under the influence of Puritan separatists. He immigrated to New England in about 1631. To be, a pure, pure, uh, to be a separatist in the 1630s was to take a step beyond simply that of the Puritans who sought to purify the church of some of the influence of the Church of England and Catholicism. To be a separatist was to insist upon the removal of every element of those traditions. Uh, William's position was so radical and extreme that even uh, his non-separatist Puritan brothers and sisters booted him from the Massachusetts Bay Colony and sent him out into the howling wilderness where he founded the Rhode Island Colony and helped to start the First Baptist Church in America. Over the course of his life, Williams became so convinced of the need to establish a pure church composed only of those persons who were among God's elect that he determined that there could be no church on this earth until in his theology, Jesus returned. He could only establish the purity of himself and of his wife. He presents his theological framework in a book entitled The Bloody Tenet of Persecution, published in 1644 as a conversation between truth and peace. The book was not widely read in the 17th century because he dedicated it to Parliament and Parliament ordered all copies burned. But it came to have a remarkable influence upon religious liberty and separation of church and state. One of the things that he concluded is that one does not have to reside, well this is really my conclusion, one does not have to reside under a government in which religion and state are separate in order to champion religious liberty in a way that is in line with the deepest convictions of faith. Actually, Islam has showed us this path in the past in a very powerful way. Williams couldn't tolerate compulsion in religious belief, saying it was tantamount to requiring, quote, an unwilling spouse to enter into a forced bed, unquote. He detested the fact that people who did not believe in God were forced to take public oaths in the name of God. In the course of his life, Williams freed God from the human mind as much as any other human being, and certainly more than most any Baptist. What Williams essentially argued is that as a sinful and fallible human being, he could not ultimately understand or grasp the mind of God. And so therefore, neither he nor any other human being could compel others to any religious assertion about God. If he made such absolute statements, then he usurped the place of God, provided absolute proof of his own sinful state, and in the process, violated one of the most foundational theological assertions of his own religious tradition. The starting point of William's argument, then, is his radical notion that Almighty God does not seek or demand the utilization of violence in order to accomplish God's purposes in the world. Williams insisted that Jesus Christ himself had decreed that, quote, the tares or weeds and the wheat should be let alone in the world and not plucked up until the harvest, which is the end of the world, unquote. He points out how often tares or weeds become wheat, and how often blasphemers and persecutors, in his words, become faithful. 
and idolaters become worshipers of God if their salvation is left up to God and not to a sinful humanity. He warns in his own day, quote, of hundreds and thousands, men, women, children, fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, old, young, murdered, famished, and these cries on the part of the religious power holders that men fling away the spiritual sword and spiritual artillery in spiritual and religious causes and rather trust for the suppressing of each other's gods, conscience, and religion to an arm of flesh and sword of steel, unquote. His point was that those who embrace the ways and teachings of Jesus ought to have faith and trust in God's power and ability to bring about God's purposes in the world. And no, no assistance was required from humanity. He spoke powerfully to the folly of it all over, I have that water, over the period of the previous 100 years in England. And this is how he put it. Henry VII leaves England, this is a quote, leaves England under the slavish bondage of the Pope's yoke. Henry VIII reforms all England to a new fashion, half Papist, half Protestant. King Edward VI turns about the wheels of the state and works the whole land to absolute Protestantism. Queen Mary, succeeding to the helm, steers a direct contrary course, breaks in pieces all Edward wrought, and brings forth an old edition of England's Reformation, now all Popish. Mary, not living out half her days, as the prophet speaks of bloody persons, then Elizabeth, like Joseph, advances from the prison to the palace and from irons to the crown. She plucks up all her sister Mary's plants and sounds a trumpet to all Protestants. What sober man stands not amazed at these revelations? Unquote. The key theological idea upon which, which Williams established his convictions about religious freedom and the separation of state was his belief in the huge gap between God and humanity, a gap which could never be overcome through any human effort, including even the fashioning of theocratic government. Always sinfulness and the total depravity of humanity would blind human beings and keep them from being able to ascertain the will and purposes of God. As we think about our own context and our own history, the truth of the matter today is that no government, whether in a predominantly Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, or any other context has managed to rise above its own challenges to attain the highest levels of justice to which the principles of its dominant religious expression aspire. Such is the case in Israel where the Jewish ideal has suffered in the face of the plight of the Palestinian peoples. It's the case with democracy in the United States or in Western Europe or parts of sub-Saharan Africa where Christianity has held sway in terms of the moral foundations of the nations and yet injustice runs rampant as we have just heard. And it's certainly the case in every predominantly Muslim nation in the world. No one comes close to embodying the ideals of their own particular majority faith. William's simple insistence was that God's truth be allowed to grow up in the world without being restrained by human governments. He was against persecution in any form. This for him was the only path to truth, and it is also the only path to peace. Williams was a creative thinker whose greatest gift was the ability to follow ideas through to their ultimate conclusions. He pushed on where others stopped. He articulated for all of us a theological conviction that nearly any person of religion can embrace. He did it precisely because he was a radical extreme person of faith who believed that his faith commitment was the absolute truth beyond any conceivable doubt. But he also recognized the limitations of his own sinfulness, something very few of us are usually willing to do. And it was this recognition that led him to articulate a doctrine of religious freedom based upon religious radicalism. And I cite some examples from all of our sacred texts. There is a way to peace among the religions of the world that results not from a moderation of our religious beliefs, but rather from a more radical embrace of them. 
Much conflict in the world today is the product of religious difference, either between religions or within them. We often decry religious radicalism as the cause of such conflict, and we seek to remove religion from the public square in order to maintain the peace. From Williams, we learn that true peace and freedom in the world is far more likely to be accomplished when we follow the teachings of our religions through to their most radical conclusions rather than stopping short at the point of moderation. For it is in the radical forms of faith properly expressed that we find the largest measures of love, hope, and grace. If my Baptist brothers and sisters had actually listened to Williams, perhaps these words would have been the words offered up about us at a conference on religious diversity at the Carter Center in 1996. Thank you very much.